So I said to my daughter, I said, darling, it doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter that you're good at maths, that you can run, that you're athletic. It doesn't matter about your character. Darling, it only matters how beautiful you are. You know, your physical appearance, how pretty you are. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't sound right, does it? But my great concern is this is how we're starting to value our built environment. And of even greater concern, this is how we're starting to value our modern gems. These buildings that are not so old, that are within the danger zone, that's 60 years of age. And let's take Sirius for example. Here we have these modern buildings, these buildings that are vessels of our stories, these cultural artefacts. These buildings that contain the stories of who we are, where we've come from and where we're going to. And if we keep on erasing these modern beauties, these brutalist beauties, we start to lose our storyline, or what I call we start to lose our missing middle. Now, you can imagine people coming to these shores and they're seeing these old buildings, these hundred-year-old buildings, and they're looking at them and then they're suddenly looking at a city like Sydney with these great skyscrapers and they're going, but guys, I don't get how you got to there. And of course, if they're asking me, I'm going to say, well, it's going to be pretty hard for me to explain it because we've erased all those buildings in the middle. We've lost those cultural artefacts. We have that missing middle. And you know, we have to be careful that we don't get so obsessed with the new that new doesn't become everything we're about, and then once new's gone, it sort of disappears. Because new becomes the emperor's new clothes, and we really start to lose ourselves. We start to lose the understanding of what our culture is. We have to mean more than that. And here's a story, an anecdote, that I think will help frame what I'm trying to say. I think we all know this building, right? It's the Queen Victoria building. And I think it'd be fair to say that Sydney or Australia loves this building. It was built in the 1880s, when Sydney was called the Golden City. I mean, we had streets lined with these beautiful sandstone buildings. But you know, in the 1980s, we wanted to demolish this building. We wanted to demolish this building for a car park. <laughs> Extraordinary, isn't it? But, you know, I don't think we knew how to value these buildings. I don't think these buildings were or the, the current orthodoxy of what architecture was. The only way we knew how to value these buildings was through a financial model. And you know what? I think a car park stacked up pretty well. Well, thank God we had people that had the time and the patience that were able to persuade enough people to keep this building. Because, as we know, the Queen Victoria building now is one of the most successful commercial shopping centres we have in this country. Because we're able to keep this building and revalue it and repurpose it, it goes on as not only a cultural artefact, but a successful, profitable building. And so too, I think, that's where we're at with brutalism. Now, I get that brutalism is... We're having trouble in, in this society, our society at the moment, to try and understand how we value these buildings. You see, I think we're struggling because it's not in the ar architectural orthodoxy. It's not in that moment of time. But to understand what I'm saying, I think we need to understand brutalism. I mean, brutalism has these massive civic features, these big structural elements, these grand gestures. I mean, they are essentially civic castles, these buildings that were built to last for hundreds of years. And like those medieval castles, they were built as utilitarian structures to stay and last. And we love those castles today. But, you know, brutalism and, and its architects were much more concerned about other things in society. It was as much a social, ethical and moral movement as it was an architectural movement. And our architects of the time were imbued with this moral consciousness. They were concerned about the state above the individual and they wanted to build the buildings that reflected that. They were concerned with great projects like social housing. You see, I think we're struggling to value brutalism today because the architectural and social ideologies move so far from that orthodoxy that we're struggling to understand it. And I think brutalism is holding a mirror up to ourselves and we look in there and sometimes we don't always like what we see. But you know, in the 1960s, brutalism was the architecture 
And in, in Europe and the UK, they were building these great off-form, raw concrete buildings, like the masterworks of Le Corbusier and his famous Unité de Habitation in Marseille, or the sublime, raw concrete monastery in France called La Tourette. And that's where the name came from, from the French word Breton Brut, which translates as raw concrete. And whilst the great American architecture critic didn't coin the phrase, he certainly popularised it. So when he started to call these Breton Brut buildings brutalist, it stuck to that style like glue to a blanket. So what are the great architectural brutalist buildings that we have here in this city or in this country? I mentioned Sirius a little bit earlier, and here she is again in all her glory. Now, recently, the Heritage Council made a recommendation to the Heritage Minister to list Sirius on two criteria. The first one was the architecture, the aesthetics. It's an exemplary example. The second one is its cultural value. It's so fundamentally imbued in that social, cultural fight that we had in the rocks and the green band movement. But there's more. I had a former boss that used to say, Sean, this is the second best building in the country. It's Cole Madigan's High Court building in Canberra. It's a built diagram of our democracy. We have this great contained volume, and that volume represents this nation. And in that volume, we have three courts that sit at various heights in that space. And as you move up through those courts, they become more and more powerful. Until you get to the very top, the, the highest court. That's the full bench of the high court, the most powerful court we have in this country. And then you know what Madigan does? He does something that's so fundamental about de our democracy. He grabs the people and he puts them above them all as that built diagram of democracy, saying that in this country, the people stand above all else. And right next door to that is Madigan's other great commission, the National Art Gallery in Canberra, a building so fine that the Art Gallery lists it as one of its exhibits. Or here in Sydney, and you've probably all seen this building, it's the, the very moulded and figured Reader's Digest building in Surrey Hills. The Australian Institute of Architects this year awarded it its 25-year Enduring Architecture Prize. Or there's the Masonic Lodge. Now, only those with a secret handshake have probably been in there, but let me tell you, this is one of the greatest interiors in the country. And then there's Ken Woolley's famous town hall office building, and one of my favourites, the old UTS Karingai campus building, a sublime piece of architecture. And if you've been to Macquarie University and you've been in the quadrangle, you would have seen those extraordinary brutalist buildings that frame out that quadrangle. And who could forget, and of course we're here in Sydney, so we should mention him, one of Australia's most famous architects, Harry Seidler, and his extraordinarily brutalist works. So I ask you the question, why should we keep these great brutalist buildings? Well, we should keep them because they are fundamentally a snapshot in time of what we thought, of what we felt, what our ethics and morals were at that point in time. And sure, we may have moved on from the time that fueled that, that, that whole thinking, that architectural style. It doesn't make them any less relevant. And we need to keep them because they are the containers of our story. We need to keep them, and we need to fight to keep them, like Jack Mundy did here in the rocks with the terrace houses, because they fundamentally hold those stories for us to tell and retell into the future. And Sirius is no different. This building is a building that we value for not only the exemplary architecture, but for everything it is and contains of cultural value. We need to keep the stories that tell us what we are and who we are and where we've come from. We need to be able to tell those stories and retell those stories. So if we keep on losing that middle, we lose that story, we lose the continuum. We're, we're unable to join the dots between what those stories are so we can tell and retell those stories into the future. And you know, there's great value in keeping these buildings. They've used a great amount of energy to get there. So if these buildings are useful, so if they're, they're fit for purpose or we can find a new purpose for them, much like the Queen Victoria building, we can use all that energy the embodied energy, the energy that's gone to make the materials, like the concrete, and the constructional energy used to hold these buildings up. So who decides what we keep, and how do we decide that? Well, here in New South Wales, we have a group of experts called the Heritage Council, 
and they make recommendations, but they don't decide what buildings to keep. All they do is they make a recommendation to the heritage minister. These people are uniquely qualified to do this. And here's the rub. Recently, Sirius was recommended to the minister to be listed on the State Heritage Register, and the minister refused. Now, I believe we need to trust our experts. They are uniquely qualified to look into the future, to understand the significance of these social and cultural artefacts so that we can keep them, not only for ourselves, so we can continue to tell that story, but to talk for the people that are not yet born so they can understand their story as they move into the future. And we need to spend time with these buildings. And I believe if we spend some time with these buildings, we'll learn to love them all over again. We need to spend time with them to understand them, to value them, so that we can keep them and retell our story. And like the Queen Victoria building, these buildings have great value. And if we can not only keep them as cultural markers, but if they're fit for purpose for other uses that can be commercially viable and profitable, we have a great building. So like the future we hold for our daughter, and that we hope her society that understands her for all that she is, for the content of her character, for how smart she is or how athletic she is or how kind she is. So too do I hope that we understand and we give the same respect to our brutalist buildings, that we give it the time to understand, to keep them, to contain these stories. And I'm convinced that with a little bit of time and deeper understanding, you too will learn to love these buildings, and yes, for even how they look. Thank you.